Many groups have led social change movements around the world, but most people have not heard of community organizing and activism led by survivors of human rights violations committed by the mental health system. People who have experienced mental health challenges are often quiet about their lives. People can lose their jobs, housing, friends, and liberty if the wrong person finds out their story. Over the years, many survivors of psychiatric human rights violations have bravely spoken out and led the movement for human rights of those harmed by the psychiatric system. Historically, the movement has gone by many names, such as the MAD movement, consumer movement, survivor movement, and ex-patient movement. The all-inclusive name is the CSX movement. It is really based on the civil rights movement. It's one of our last movements ever. We still don't have our full citizenship rights. We still can't make decisions on our own. Following the commercialization of the first psychiatric drugs in the 1950s and 60s, deinstitutionalization moved to the forefront in various countries. This led to far too many abandoned expatients struggling with little to no expectation of recovery. By the early 1970s, groups of expatients in the US started meeting to create spaces for peer support and political organizing. They're creating alternatives, drop-in centers, and I'm like, what, really? And I remember saying to Judy Chamberlain, I said, who's allowing you to do this? She said, us, we're free, we can do this. One of the most effective leaders of the CSX movement has been Oregon-based activist David Oakes. In college, a working class kid at Harvard, I uh, ran into some major uh, emotional and mental problems. So in my sophomore, junior, and senior years, I, I ended up inside the mental health system. I was put in solitary confinement and forcibly injected with a psych drug and left there. And I remember staring out of the window there. They have this impenetrable uh, steel mesh screen over the window. I kept pounding the screen. And I said, when I get out of here, I am going to do some major damage to this system. A volunteer agency actually referred me in my junior year to work with a psychiatric survivor group, Mental Patients Liberation Rock. So that was my, my first meeting with folks in the movement. The pioneers discovered they were not alone in the hurt and anger they felt toward the psychiatric system. They united in small communities and found understanding, meaning, and personal healing. Word of the movement reached psychiatric survivors around the world through publications such as the San Francisco-based journal Madness Network News. The first organizers found allies in other social change movements, as well as professionals such as the late psychiatrist Dr. Thomas Zaz, who openly criticized coercive psychiatry in his book, The Manufacture of Madness. It was fantastic to feel there were other people in so many other lands who had lives like me. Also what was fantastic was there were professionals that were speaking out. As more groups formed, annual meetings took place connecting survivors around the world. The first International Conference on Human Rights and Against Psychiatric Oppression took place in 1973. 
small groups met to discuss goals of the expatients' liberation movement. One of the early ways that we psych survivors gather was an annual meeting called the International Conference for Human Rights and Against Psychiatric Oppression. And we met for about a decade from the mid 70s through the 80s. And one of the early ones we met in San Francisco and we sat down in front of the FDA and blocked an entrance. We really had directly stepped in front of the psychiatrist. We were unafraid. We were powerful together. Alone, we could be locked up, injected, lose our lives, be electroshocked, but together, we can, we are invulnerable. This momentum slowed as the 70s came to an end. Psychiatric survivors, still dealing with heavy oppression from their mistreatment in the mental health system, struggled to get along with one another, leading to divisiveness in the movement. Self-help and alternative programs soon started accepting government funding, with many members combining traditional and non-traditional support services. After a while, um, the government decided that they wanted to pay for some of these ideas. And this has happened in every movement. You know, there's, there's people who are in the movement and then there's other people who break that up because they don't want that to happen. By the mid 1980s, the movement became dependent on government funding, which brought an end to radical organizing. Madness Network News and the International Conference on Human Rights and Against Psychiatric Oppression came to an end and the first government-funded alternatives conference was held. Now, of course, there are going to be strings with government money, but it has been disempowering in some senses that we as a group are not listened to as much. Whatever resources there are going into this are going into um, state-funded, federally-funded, government-funded peer support, which has led to less organizing, less activism, less protesting. It was a difficult decade. People were just finding themselves. And the system really didn't believe that people could recover. Recovery wasn't a word for someone with mental illness. Oh, you're in remission, okay? <laughs> or you're never going to get better. This is the best that you can do. So don't think any more of yourself because you, you can't do it. And those are the messages that came out. And it can't help to internalize it. At the start of the 90s, many psychiatric survivors decided the movement needed to unify. On one hand, were people who rejected the medical model and fought to abolish psychiatry. On the other hand, were people who accepted their diagnosis and fought to get more funding for psychiatric services. Both sides agreed on the need for human rights in the mental health system and rejected forced drugging, solitary confinement, restraint, involuntary commitment, and electroshock. To advance this mission, Support Coalition, which is present-day Mind Freedom International, emerged under the leadership of Janet Foner and David Oakes. Our movement has had a lot of internal conflict. So for us supporting each other and taking Action was the crucial difference. I want to give a lot of credit to National Association for Rights Protection and Advocacy, NARPA. They had a big meeting in Portland, Oregon, 
in the fall of 1988, and several of us met at the next meeting gathering. We brought a bunch of people together, activists to discuss what to do, and we decided to hold a counter conference to the American Psychiatric Association in May 1990 in New York City. And we pulled it off. It was the beginning of Support Coalition. As the movement grew, Support Coalition organized a retreat in March of 2000 in an effort to form a more unified movement. 30 leading activists came together and devised the unanimous Highlander Statement of Concern and Call to Action. I was asked to go to a meeting at the Highlander Center, and this center is in Tennessee, and it's where Martin Luther King Jr. and Rosa Parks went to strategize about the civil rights movement. It was just really great. But when we were there, it was all psychiatric survivors. We were concerned the way the mental health system was going. It was going into involuntary commitments, so no more voluntary services that people might want to choose. Everything is going to be about force. The group of activists, called the Highlander 30, returned home at the end of the three-day retreat, feeling inspired and ready to act individually and collectively. Now that we have journeyed through the origins of the CSX movement, in our next segment, we will hear how individuals and groups are approaching community organizing today.